Oh, thank you so much, Kim. That was so lovely. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, we are just so grateful that you're still willing to do this. I mean, uh, oh. it just gets the meetings off to such a wonderful start. It, it's my pleasure. I, I just, I, I decided to whip out summer because it was so a fun practice. Uh, a little bit grueling to go through the levers, but I just thought, oh, I'd give it a wing. And then the the river, uh, Dymo Dow, I thought what uh, my my that was my astronomy teacher's favorite song. So if he's listening. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks again. Oh, we, we really appreciate it. It was lovely. Um, and uh, welcome everybody to the August meeting of Orange County Astronomers. Um, in case you hadn't realize that. My name is Barbara Toy. I happen to be the current president. And uh, it is a real pleasure to invite you all here. Um, before we go to the announcements, um, I, I just wanted to um, highlight the fact that we had to move the star barbecue from July, the, the July Anza star party to the August Anza star party. So if uh, you were sorry that you missed it in July, you actually can attend. Um, and I hope that we will actually see you there. Um, then uh, the other thing is uh, we still do not know exactly when we're going to be going back to regular in-person meetings at Chapman. Um, they have not confirmed that yet at Chapman for us. So our expectation at this point is that we will not be going there for September because uh, otherwise we'd be announcing that here. And uh, we're hoping that we will be back in October, uh, but that's still kind of up in the air. Keep an eye on the website. We will let you know as soon as we know. Uh, and with that, um, Doug Millar is going to be filling in on the announcements and I get to chip in as appropriate. <laughs> Take it away, Doug. <laughs> Unmute myself. Good, Barb. Thanks um, for handing it off. Glad to know about the meetings. And and I'm sure when we get something uh, official going on, uh, we'll uh, let everybody know as, as thoroughly as we can on all our media. And hopefully that will happen by October. Okay. So tonight's the August meeting. Uh, we have some new members, uh, Elizabeth Salazar and Michael uh, Starlet. And Michael, Mike Taggart, a personal friend of mine, glad, glad to see those guys here because of their the trip up to OVRO. And Omar Callan, Jennifer Giancarlo, and uh, the rest. Oh, and George Rothbart, uh, a mathematics professor from uh, Marin County, wants to be a member. So we've got some pretty nice, uh, we always have nice members, and glad to see you guys uh, with us. Um, some of them were attracted by Cosmic Adventures and signed up for that reason. And speaking of cosmic adventures, we have lots of special interest groups. Um, and check the OCA calendar. The website and the calendar are usually up to date and a, a good place to check. Um, <clears throat> Astrophysics, August 19th, and, and meet at the Heritage Museum. Astro Imagers uh, still being uh, arranged for. Beginner's class, September 5th. Yay! So if you know someone who has a brand new um, uh, telescope, <clears throat> has a telescope they don't know, feel comfortable operating, uh, come to the beginner's class and I'll help you. Uh, board meeting is September 11th. Oh, good to know. I forgot about that. It's open to everybody, but especially it's open to board members, as you might suspect. Um, um, actually, Doug, uh, if I might cut in on the beginner's class, I believe the September meeting is the first meeting of the six month cycle. Oh. Um, so uh, that would be if, if you uh, want to get oriented in astronomy that's a really good session to uh to attend yeah it's sort sure. of the overview of of astronomy everything you want to know about astronomy in a couple hours Excellent. and, and the, bo the board meeting is open to members only members yes of course not not general uh, public no no um and uh how about the star parties uh, we've got the the one in august the star barbecue and um yeah. The Orange the County Star Party, um, we need a we need someone to assist the coordinator. Um, the uh, uh, so if uh, if you can be present uh, and and host at Irvine Park, um, please contact uh, me or 
Um, uh, anybody on the board, let us know that you're interested, that you're able to do it. Uh, we can't get the star parties going until we do have somebody who can actually physically host them. Um, okay. So, so host that's why it says TBA. So the what does the hosting mean if somebody has to have to open the gate? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, they, they have they to open the gate, yeah. close the gate. Um, and, and just basically monitor, make sure people are where they're supposed to be. Um, and, so and, you, you know, can... if people want you know, details, um, I know, get, get in contact if you're at all interested and, and we can talk about details. Okay. It's not, so it's not a big job. You can go up there and observe, but basically they're to open mm -hmm. and shut the gate and kind of keep track of things. Right. Okay. Well, that sounds like a pretty easy to do job. All righty. Next one. Next slide. Magic slide turner, there we go, ANZA site. We're resuming our monthly ANZA star parties, okay? Uh, if you've got a pad up there or an area, uh, bring, bring a rake and a shovel and a broom and, and prepare to, to uh, clean up a little bit. Um, I think I did that anyway when I, when I had my own pad, but it's about that season. August is a great time to go up to the ANZA and do some good observing. There should be lots of people there. Um, yeah, so, and that'll be the star right? Outreach events. Uh, Cecilia Caballero is, is making a list that schools are, schools are going to start on Monday, and they're going to start filling up the list of outreach events. So if you one, one technique is if you're not really sure how to use your telescope, you don't want to go all the way out to ANZA and everything, show up at a star party and point your telescope at the moon. <laughs> and, and kind of get the hang of it. Set it up in the daytime so you kind of go know where all the nuts and bolts are, and um, and then and then set it up. And if you get stumped and you're out at, at an outreach event, somebody will come over and help you uh, get the telescope set up the right way, and away you go. It's a really kind of painless way to learn more about your telescope and to let people see some astronomy that know less about it than you do, which is always rewarding. <laughs> Okay, Galileo would tell us, um, I can't mimic him, but Galileo started when he was just a couple of years old, uh, telling us what the moon was like because he recognized it one day when he was like two years old. So Wayne and Gibbous, uh, August uh, 12th, and I think Chris will tell us more about it uh, in the What's Up. Okay, the Adopt-A-Scope program. Um, we actually have lots of telescopes, and I know when I started uh, in, in astronomy in 94, I bought three telescopes in four months, and there was a lot of damage done to my checkbook. Well, you don't need to do that anymore. You can borrow a telescope, and when you realize that's not the one you should really have, you can borrow a different one, and we trade them back and forth, and there's quite a bit of, of going back and forth. And if you really like one, you can buy it, but that way you'll know that that's the one you really want, unlike me with a whole garage full of telescopes I'll never use. Actually, Doug, just a minor correction. I, I, we've kind of changed that a bit. It's not really borrowing it. So you can set up one to buy. And if you really don't like it, you can take it back and get something that might be better for you. Yeah, but it's not like going to Scope City and paying $500 I, and walking it's, away. It's, a, it's much more reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> Good. All righty. Thanks, Alan. Keep going. Oh, yeah. Serious astronomer. I can't encourage you enough. So just write a couple of paragraphs about your astronomical adventures. Even if it was an, I should write about me and my dad going to Mount Palomar in 1948 and how instructive it was to see a picture of Andromeda and turn that into Dave Fisher and have it be an article in this serious astronomer. He, he and the club appreciate all kinds of stuff like that. So turn it in if you can. Uh, and you can get a hard copy or a digital copy, whichever you like. Um, just let us know. Weed clearance. That's why I said bring your stuff. If you have a weed whacker, oh, you're going to be a king for a night or king for an afternoon. <laughs> uh, and and uh, get rid of some weeds up there. So, uh, yeah, just, you know, no, we don't have a maid service at ANZA. There is no maid service. So whatever whatever mess you make is a mess you have to clean up. But um, uh, everybody chips in, so it's not too bad. So the next meeting is September 9th. Uh, and likely to be online. I've been enjoying those, and the Reza has done a fantastic job here, here. Mm -hmm. of, of helping us out and keeping things going. So what's up tonight is by no other than Chris Butler. Sir, I turn it over to you. Okay, <laughs> thanks, Doug. Uh, let's, uh, let's jump into the world of the sky here. Uh, so greetings to OCAers from Wits End by the Sea to uh, the Cosmic Debris. 
got a little something for you folks here. Um, let me jump over to the what's up. Um, what do we got going on? Well, we always start with the moon. Of course, Galileo can't be with us, but the information, as always, from Galileo is absolutely correct. I'll confirm that. Um, let's start out with what's going on with the moon right now. Um, we're right around full moon. We're just past it, as Galileo would have told us, meaning it's now a waning gibbous moon. It's a bright moon. Um, and that is a little bit of a problem because we have the uh, Perseid meteor shower in full swing tonight and tomorrow. Mm -hmm. It is one of the best meteor showers of the year. But unfortunately, we do have a lot of light competition from that moon. Uh, there will be some straggler Perseids for a few more days. So as you get around to the 18th, the moon won't rise until midnight at last quarter. Um, so maybe you'll be able to catch a few. Uh, Dark of the Moon will be at the end of the month on August 27th. Looking at the planets, a couple things here. Uh, my color coding system is red means don't look at it or impossible, then orange, I suppose you could. Yellow, ah, maybe. Green, pretty darn good. Blue, you need to look at this. And as you can see, there are a couple blue ones, but let's start at the top of the list. Mercury, not badly placed. It's in the evening sky, um, so it's in the west after sunset, and right about now, it's swinging through its best. Our opposition time is going to be August 27th, or the elongation, evening elongation, August 27th. Good time for Mercury if you want to try to catch it. Uh, looking at Venus, Venus very much not in the evening sky, morning object, right before the sun comes up. It is bright, uh, but it's not very high, so uh, you might want to look for that. Um, Mars, Mars back in our skies, uh, rising round about midnight. It is getting bright, magnitude zero. Notice Mars is also starting to get larger in your telescopes, 8.8 arc seconds right now. We're getting closer to Mars, so you do want to start paying attention to it. We're going to get close and pass it in December. Uh, diagram to follow in a moment. So Mars, think about it. Jupiter, uh, Beautiful now. Uh, it rises 9.50 p.m., so just about 10. Uh, it's at its highest at 4 a.m., but it'll be with you all in the later evenings. And, of course, it's brilliant and always great in a telescope. Saturn steals the show, though. Saturn is at opposition. It's at its theoretical best right now, naked eye bright. The rings are open 24 hours a day, so to speak, meaning they're tilted to our, to our line of sight. Saturn's fantastic right now. So catch that for sure. Uh, Uranus and Neptune uh, rise later. They're not absolutely at their best, especially um, uh, Uranus doesn't rise till midnight. Yeah, you want to catch it in the morning hours, you can. Pluto, blue. Why? It's not bright, obviously. You need a big telescope, but it's at its theoretical best right now in eastern Sagittarius. So you want to catch Pluto? Give her a try. As far as planets Saturn and Jupiter there at the top do steal the show, the diagram of, or the photographs of Mars there on the bottom are scaled to show how Mars will be getting bigger and bigger and bigger as we get closer to it, coming up on that December pass. So hmm. you can see I marked Mars now. That's the size of Mars now. It is swelling in size, so you want to be watching Mars over the next couple of months. This shows the uh, the orbits of Earth and Mars. Sometimes we pass Mars when Mars is at its closest, as you see on the uh, right side of your diagram. The next opposition when we pass Mars is kind of a medium opposition, ballpark of, uh, I believe, 18 arc seconds from Mars. Not a bad one, certainly not like on the left side of your diagram when Mars and Earth are farthest apart when they pass. So pretty good. We definitely do want to check it out. Looking at the sky at 8 o'clock, uh, you can see the sun is just going down. Mercury is labeled there. So the sky would actually still be pretty bright at this point. But you want to catch Mercury in the west just as the sky is starting to dim, get a little darker. Uh, notice Saturn is rising at the same time Mercury is getting closer to setting. So Saturn starts your uh, your planet observations nice and early. Let's give it another hour, though. Let the sky rotate a little bit. Saturn is well clear of the horizon now, so you want to be looking at that. 
As far as the stars, we have the Summer Triangle, of course, marked by the bright stars of Deneb, Vega, and Altair in three different constellations. Uh, you've got bright Arcturus in Bootes the Herdsman, which is high overhead and moving out to the west. Um, I'm actually going to be looking down to the south, though. This is the best time for a couple of my absolutely favorite constellations and the very first ones I looked at when I first got a telescope. Um, they are these, and there are some familiar patterns. This is down in the south near the southern horizon, which would be at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can see a bright orange star. It will catch your attention. And you can see a kind of a curvy shape. Uh, and you can also see next to it, on the left part of your screen, what looks like a teapot. These are the constellations of Scorpius the Scorpion and Sagittarius the Archer. Uh, Scorpius does kind of look like Scorpion. That helps. It's got this bright star Antares uh, at its heart, and its stinger at the end of its curving tail is marked by Shala. Uh, the constellation of Libra, by the way, is also in the neighborhood just to the west of Scorpius, but it's quite a bit fainter. The stars of Sagittarius are fairly, fairly dim here in the city, uh, but the tea pattern, teapot pattern really is distinctive. Looking at the constellation of Scorpius here, uh, there are lots of things you could hunt down here. And as a matter of fact, zooming in a little bit, let me tell you about the very first thing that I found right near Antares, the heart of the scorpion. Do you see just to the right of it, which is to the west, there is a yellow circle, crosshair marking in it. That's the symbol for a globular star cluster. M4 is right next to Antares. And M4 is one of the best of these kind of objects, my favorite kind of objects, uh, but it's easy to find. If you can find this bright star, just scoot your telescope slightly to one side and you found it. That was the first thing I found with my own telescope and it remains a personal favorite. Um, there are other star clusters all through the constellation of different types. Uh, toward the bottom of the curve of the uh, Scorpion, when you take it down and it starts to bend, a bend uh, NGC 6231, picture to follow, one of my favorites. And then off the Stinger, another pretty easy spot to find. Right off the Stinger, you'll find M7 and M6. These are two open star clusters, very different than a globular star cluster. Um, the star Antares, uh, although it's just a bright star in our skies, if you do deep space imaging, you take long exposure photographs, you'll see all kinds of clouds of nebulosity around the star. Beautiful region of the, uh, of the galaxy. Notice M4 standing out there brilliantly and big, looks like spilled salt, one of my favorite things. Uh, I mentioned NGC 6231. Um, that is a lovely star cluster right down in the coils of the scorpion's tail. M M7 and its neighbor M6 are beautiful uh, open star clusters. Fewer stars, but nice and bright. Can't recommend M7 and M6 enough right off the tail of the scorpion. Sagittarius here, zooming in a little bit to see it better. Uh, you can see the teapot shape. This is an area that I like a lot uh, toward the center of our galaxy and deep in the Milky Way uh, across the sky. If you could be out in the desert, you could see it. Um, I want to mention one thing to look for in particular. Right off the top of the teapot is M28, another globular star cluster. It's almost on top of, actually behind, the star on the top of the teapot. But if you scoot just slightly east or to the left in your uh, your screen, you'll see M22. Now, M22, picture to follow, one of the best objects. Um, we've also got M8 and M20, which are to, a little bit to the west or to the right on screen of the teapot. These are some of the most beautiful nebulae, gas clouds in the sky. First things first, the Milky Way is at its widest and just about its brightest in this part of the sky, we're looking towards the center of our galaxy. So I strongly uh, recommend if you get out into a dark sky, you'll have no trouble understanding that Sagittarius and Scorpius are special because they're looking for downtown in our galaxy. On this picture right here, you can see on the left, the glowing pink and blue patches, that is M8 and M20, the Lagoon and Triffid Nebulas. Here's another picture of them from Fort Lewis Observatory. The lagoon here, M8, is on your left, and M20 is on the right. Here's a close-up of M20. 
Star Trek fans will recognize this as being the one that was used in a Star Trek episode, a slide of this, where they zoomed in and out and in and out to suggest some kind of space warp or something. I, I have, you know, I, I have PTSD about this star cluster zooming in and out and in and out on old Star Trek. A beautiful uh, nebula to look at. Here's M22. If you like stars, you can't get enough of them. This thing has half a million suns in it. Looks like spilled salt, and again, just right off the teapot pattern. M17 is the Swan Nebula, which is in the far northern part of the constellation on the border with Serpens. Also very close to M16, technically in Serpens. That's the Pillars of Creation Nebula, the Eagle Nebula, famous from so many Hubble Space Telescope pictures. So you might want to hunt down the Swan. Really like that one. Uh, we do have that uh, uh, meteor shower, the Perseid meteor shower, in progress right now. Uh, these seem to come from the constellation of Perseus. To see the shower, you have to wait till Perseus is above the horizon. Well, 11 o'clock at night or so will do that. Before that, we can't see any meteors, moon or no. They just don't strike the atmosphere on this part of the planet until after that time. Um, this shows the uh, midnight sky, and I've labeled Perseus there. It's rising in the northeast, so the show could start. But there is that blessed moon blazing out light and making it harder to see things. Um, so a little bit of a complication this time, but there are plenty of other things to look at at midnight. Um, you see constellation Capricornus in the south. There's an extra bright star there. That's Saturn. And if you look to the other side in the constellation of Pisces, which is rising in the east, there's a really bright star. That's Jupiter. We'll label them in the next picture here. If you wait till just before dawn, you can see a parade of planets all the way from Saturn in the west to that moon that was giving you so much trouble with your meteors. But then Neptune could be hunted down with a telescope. Jupiter, brilliant and obvious to everybody's eyes. And then we've got Uranus. Again, you need a telescope for that one. And then you've got Mars, which is nice and bright to your eyes. And to add to it just before the sun comes up, Venus. Whew, that's a lot of planets to look at. Uh, so the sky is certainly offering us an awful lot to look at this time. Frankly, I'm exhausted, and so I will leave you with uh, a wish for clear skies and a beautiful picture of the Lagoon Nebula in Sagittarius. Whew, there we are. And now I hand it back over. Thank, Thank you very much, Chris, for yet another great What's Up. Totally enjoyed it uh thank you hi my name is reza and i'm the vice president of the club i too would like to welcome you to the august 12th 2022 general meeting of the orange county astronomers um and uh, let's keep the uh meeting flowing with yet another great presentation our speaker at this meeting is a professor at calvin university and got his phd in astronomy from harvard he oversaw the construction of the calvin Rehoboth Observatory in 2003, a 16-inch optical guidance system telescope located in north, northwest New Mexico, operated remotely by Calvin students in Michigan. Among other things, over 180 asteroids were discovered with his telescope with this telescope, along with one asteroid satellite. Uh, he and his uh, students' team were subject of the movie Luminous, which we had a screening of. Please join me now in welcoming Dr. Larry Muller. Larry. Hello. Do you hear me well? Well, yes, perfect. Good. Let me uh, share my screen here. There we are. And do you see the first uh, slide there? Good. We do all perfect. Great. Well, thank you for inviting me. And I hope you uh, enjoyed the film uh, last fall, those of you who did see it. Um, I'll give a brief synopsis of it uh, in the talk today, though that's not the main 
part of today's talk, recognizing that uh, not everyone uh, had a chance to see the film. Um, I'll give some good news at the top though. The film ended with some question about uh, the future of astronomy at Calvin University. And I can give you an update that uh, they have restored our astronomy program within the physics department uh, just this past spring. So um, what we're talking about today uh, will continue to happen in the uh, years to come. And I'm very excited to talk to you today. Um, the film was dramatic. If you didn't have a chance to see it, uh, hopefully you'll get a chance uh, sometime later. I think it will be on a streaming service uh, within the next uh, half year or so. Um, but it really, uh, the film concluded in 2019 and much of the big progress I've made has been since then, uh, really trying to understand this subject of contact binary stars, stars that are very accessible really for amateur astronomers. And just as local stars, something I've always felt needs some understanding. Uh, it's great to explore the uh, distant corners of the universe, but we need also to understand what's going on in the, the local universe as well. When I began this project, uh, as described in the film about 10 years ago, we really had no clear understanding of how these things form, how they evolve over time, what happens to them in the end. And what you're gonna to hear today is that I think we have all three of those questions in hand now. And uh, some of that actually results from just this summer. So you're gonna hear some things that have, uh, you're gonna hear for the first time, uh, uh, worldwide scoop. <laughs> so let's uh, get on with it. First, I want to give you a little history of uh, contact binary stars, a uh, little background for those who don't even know what that term means. Um, I'll talk about how they fit into the larger question of binary stars, how they were discovered, some of their distinctives. And I want to focus in on the key questions, how they form, how they evolve, how they die, and how those questions were not obvious and simply not known before we started. I will then give a brief digression on that one particular contact binary that got me into this subject and uh, uh, was the subject of the film. Then I'm gonna give a little context just about individual stars. Uh, some of you will know this, some of you maybe not, but it's the background we need to have if we're gonna understand pairs of stars, we need to know first what individual stars are doing. And then the main, the main element tonight is um, a new model we have, or I should say new models in a sense of different uh, explanations for each of our three questions. How do they form? How do they evolve? How do they die? And uh, how do we know if any of this is right? Before I launch into it though, I'd like to just uh, give it one slide on the nature of astronomy. Uh, themes that are relevant when we're doing scientific puzzle solving. First of all, what is our goal? Our goal in my mind is to have powerful models. That means models that make specific predictions. You can have a model that could be true, but if it doesn't predict anything, what are you gonna do with it? Uh, be they right or be they wrong, models with specific predictions move the field along. And uh, I've got, I think, some in both categories here. That's what we're looking for. Now, when we're making those models, we have to look at the puzzle pieces, the observations in the sky, but you can't wait for every single puzzle piece before you try and assemble it, try and see what is the picture. And that is always a, point of tension for astronomers. If you try and put things together too soon, you might get the wrong puzzle. Uh, but if you wait too long, uh, you're not going to get anything done at all. In that sense, we're also going to have the problem that sometimes you have a false puzzle piece. You have an observation that seems key, you build your model around it, and then you find out that that isn't actually correct. Uh, so at all times, you have to be reviewing the puzzles you have, the puzzle pieces you have, and making sure uh, that you can trust them. And finally, you gotta be prepared to be surprised. Especially as I go through the history part here, it's interesting to me where astronomers past had preconceived ideas and that prevented them from making progress that could well have been made long ago. 
Um, so these are the things to keep in mind as we go along. So binary stars, here's one of my favorite binary stars. I was looking at it uh, last night, actually. Uh, Albirio, straight overhead in the early evening, very colorful. Um, binary stars are more common than not. The majority of stars you see in the sky have companions. And that's an important context to know. Now, how did we get started with binary stars? Well, there's sort of two uh, origin stories here that happen almost simultaneously. And uh, the first, so the first one I'm gonna tell you about is about uh, John Goodrick in 1782, when he was just 18 years old. He was the age of a college student although he was not allowed to be a college student because he was deaf and that was uh, banned you from going to college. So without a telescope, without a college, he simply looked at the sky and discovered variations in the brightness of the star Algol by comparing it to uh, neighboring stars. And once he found variations, he watched uh, regularly, He's doing this in England. There must have been a lot of clouds, but enough to figure out that there was a periodicity to this. And he was able to find that there was a regular uh, dimming that occurred for a duration of 10 hours. Again, doing this all naked eye and um, 10 hours out of every 69. But the question is, what was going on? Well, you've probably all heard of Algol. Here's my two stars, one going in front of the other, one's going to block the other and then the other one's gonna block the one. This is what we call a light curve. The brightness over time, it's steady, and then goes down, steady, and then goes down. That's the classic binary star light curve. Now, John Goodrick, though, when he looked at this, he had two theories that he put into his paper. One was that it was just the star rotating. You can see this star here has got spots on it, so it's gonna be brighter at one point in the rotation than the other. The other idea was the, the eclipsing binary idea. He actually favored the rotating star thing because he had seen a published account from some old encyclopedia that said that algal had varied, but then it had stopped varying. So there was no long-term consistency to it. And you think about star spots, spots on the sun. Well, sometimes you see them, sometimes you don't. So he thought it had to be rotation. So this was a case right at the beginning where a puzzle piece happened to be wrong because of something he read that was published and the published thing was wrong. Here's Algol as we uh, now know it, uh, anatomically correct, one star, a little bit deformed tidally by the other star. And you can see one red, one blue, giving us a, a definite dimming when the faint star is in front and not so much of a dimming the other way around. So while that was going on, William Herschel, who I'm sure you've heard of, began a systematic survey of close double stars. He was an excellent astronomer. He had grand plans. He wanted to map the structure of the universe by looking at stars that just coincidentally happened to be double, one nearby, one far away. And uh, by taking advantage of those things that are close, maybe discovering parallax that hadn't been discovered yet, whatever there was to be had, he actually had a number of things that just co coincidental approaches of stars, uh, what we call double stars as opposed to binary stars, would help uh, find. So he was going to systematically survey the whole sky for this. In that systematic survey, he discovered Uranus, kind of a nice uh, uh, thing to do just by the way. And when asked about that discovery, he, he described it as he, having discovered it in its turn because he was gonna discover everything and he discovered that on the day it was ready to go. But he found to his surprise that there were hundreds of double stars, far more than you would expect by just a random distribution of stars and finally concluded in 18, 1802 that they were binaries, that they were physically near each other. So notice how long that took, uh, 23 years before he finally came to that conclusion that binary stars are common. Now, in particular, in 1781, he saw the star 44 Bu and saw that it was an unequal double, one star brighter than the other, just two arc seconds away. And as he was going back to that section in his systematic fashion in 1787, he noticed that the separation had changed slightly. 
and also the brightness this time was equal. So that's saying that one of the stars had changed its brightness. If he had followed this up in 1787, instead of thinking, oh, maybe there's some slow variation over six years, he would have found that in fact, 44 Bu is a triple star system. The one star is close to a pair of stars. In fact, a contact binary star. They're both G type stars, stars very much like our sun. And so, um, let's see here, good. Um, they orbit in a wide orbit, it takes 200 years to go around, but the pair only takes a quarter of a day to go around. If he had just sat on this for one night, he, he knew it varied, he could have found that it varied over the course of a night and that there in fact exist binaries that are so close to each other that they can orbit in a fraction of a day. It's a surprising period. He didn't expect anything like that. And so it was a missed opportunity. W Ursa Majoris, which is sort of the uh, prototype for this class of stars I'm talking about today, was finally identified as a contact binary centuries later by Adams and Joy in 1919. In this case, it's an orbital period of a third of a day. And the difference here is. Not only did they see the light curve of the two stars mutually eclipsing each other, but they also used spectroscopy. And you know spectroscopy tells you something about how fast things move. So you can actually see the two stars moving alternately towards you and away from you as they go around every uh, third of a day. Uh, but also you can see the stars themselves rotating, the near side of the stars coming towards you, the opposite side is going away from you. The stars are broadened in their spectrum because they're rotating so quickly. Uh, and note, by the way, um, that uh, 44 Bu was at uh, 4.8 magnitude. You can see this with your naked eye out at a dark sky site. W Earth Majoris, not so far away there in uh, the, uh, the Big Dipper, you can see in the, the figure. So close orbits, mean strong tides. And this is one of the key distinctives of contact binary stars. Strong tides means you can't just have any old orbit. Orbits that are originally elliptical become circular. Spins that are originally uh, random become synchronized. What's an example of this? Pluto and Charon is my favorite example. I got the New Horizons picture on the left of the two of them, but the New Horizons animation on the right has less resolution, but you can actually see the two going around each other, and you can see Pluto rotating around as they go around. They're each facing the same side to each other as they go around because of the strong tides. That is always the case with our contact binary stars. Now, what about the shape of contact binary stars? I really don't want to use spherical balls for contact binary stars because they're more complicated than that. The gravitational potential determines the shape. The tides are really important. So we need to talk about that. What is the gravitational potential? How far downhill are you? In the upper right, there's a picture here that shows a cross cut through the two, two stars. There's a big gravitational well where it says X minus one, uh, that's the one star. And there's another gravitational well where it says X 0.2. That's the other star. If you're in the middle of a star, you're deep in the gravitational well. But in between the two, there's what we call this L1 point. And that's the balance point between the two stars. And you may have heard of that in the context of other uh, interacting binary stars. If you can have material go through the L1 point, you can transfer material, say, from a, a red star onto a neutron star and make an X-ray star out of it. But now if you think of this as maybe water filling up a gravitational potential, if you have a low level of water, you would have two separate ponds, one on the left, one on the right. And as you fill it up more and more beyond that L1 point, then you only have one pond that is common between the two. It has to have one surface level. It's shallow near the L1 point, but it goes all the way from one side to the other. That's the possibility for these stars as long as you're filled up at least to the L1 point, but not past the L2 point. 
At the lower right, you can see uh, contour plots that show this. When you're just barely touching, it's a figure eight. When you're going all the way to the L2 point, there's that cusp on the left side, and it's as big as you can be. If you have any bigger of a star, your stuff leaks out the L2 point. Now, the L2 point you've heard in the last month, that's exactly where we put the James Webb Telescope. It's an important point, a point of balance, in our case, with the Earth and the Sun, or in this case, between the two stars. We'll come back to that L2 point. So now we have uh, this ceramic models, much more realistic than the other two models. The stars are stretched out, they're flattened because they're rotating rapidly and they're touching in the middle. One hint as we observe these, these hints are things we're gonna to have to account for when we give a model is that uh, both stars have the same temperature. That's a strange thing as we will see in a moment. Before we go on though, we have to say, how do we make models like the model I just showed you? This model definitely has a big star and a small star. Well, the one's more massive than the other. How do you know how massive it is? Well, on the left side here, we've got a model where the two stars are the same mass. And uh, below it, we have a model where the ratio of the little guy to the big guy is 0.15. So very uh, disparate masses. On the right side, they have light curves. How bright does it look as you go down? In the case of the equal mass ratios, it goes way down because you've got a really big star eclipsing another really big star. But in the case of the unequal mass ratio, it can't go that far down. Once the little star is blocked, that's all you can do. And it just uh, has a flat line there. These are distinctive shapes. So it means for any contact binary, we can figure out what the mass ratio is. So what are our questions? The first question is, how do they form? And that turns out to be a surprising uh, question in the sense that binary stars, when they form, form far apart from each other. They do this because pre-mean sequence stars, stars that haven't yet formed are big balls of gas. If you put two big balls of gas next to each other and then you let them shrink down, even if they were originally touching, they're not touching anymore once they become regular stars. So somehow we've got to get these two stars closer. Now on the upper right, I've shown two stars, newly formed, and they're what I call the Roche lobe, the figure eight pattern surrounding them. These aren't a contact binary because they're not filling their Roche lobe, but it shows how big the system is. What we need is a system with less angular momentum that will bring these two stars closer together so one can fill its Roche lobe. And that's what we have in the lower picture. The stars are the same, but since they're closer, the figure eight is smaller. And eventually the figure eight is gonna be small enough that it touches the star. To get from point A to point B, we have to lose angular momentum. And that's the physics concept I get to talk about most today. Angular momentum you're familiar with, Here's a picture of an ice skater. It's a thing that is conserved. It depends on the velocity, how fast you're going, but also the distance, how, in this case, the ice skater's arms are far apart. You have a big distance, so you have a low velocity, or when the ice skater's arms are together, you have a fast velocity. The product of those two is the thing you can't change unless you have some specific way of draining the angular momentum out. Somehow these stars, formed with a lot of angular momentum, something drained the angular momentum and brought them together. That's our first question, how do they form? Second question is gonna be, how are they stable? Once they do form, it looks like a star that's gonna collapse and uh, fall in on itself, but we know these things are very common, therefore they must last a long time. Think about that. Things that are common are things that last a long time because if they didn't, you wouldn't happen to see them the day that they were there. So you can think of histograms. Here is a histogram of the number of people in a, my state, depending on uh, their age. And uh, you can see there's not that many people that are really small. Those are the babies, a fair number of people at the uh, in between sizes, those are the children, but most people are adults. And so there's gonna be a big bubble a big uh, peak in my histogram where people spend a lot of time. 
This is the way we study stars. We look at histograms of stars and say, where do they spend most of their time? Uh, that's where we expect to see most of them. It's not always obvious when you have a histogram to know how these things are related. Uh, so there's a, a basketball player on the right. Uh, not all the people in this uh, diagram are ever gonna be as tall as he is. So maybe he's an unusual case. So getting the relationship between people, basically how do you evolve? You evolve from the right, the left side of the diagram to the right side of the diagram. Uh, we have to ask those same kinds of questions with stars and be open to the idea that maybe different stars follow different paths. This is the sort of thing we're going to do. Uh, this is a uh, histogram of contact binary stars that were uh, found in the constellation of Sagittarius that we saw a little bit earlier this evening. Um, There's a great place there where the a project called Ogle looked for five years uh, at millions and millions of stars and then found all the contact binary stars among them, among other things. They were looking for gravitational lensing. We can see some very distinctive things here. First of all, how many of them are there? 1% of stars that are like our sun turn out to be contact binaries. That's really common. We also see that there's a sharp cutoff at the short period side. They don't go less than five hours. There's another pretty sharp cutoff at the long period side. They don't tend to be longer than about uh, 15 hours. But then at the lower right there, there is a long tail, not many guys in it, but that goes all the way out to a few days. Each of these distinctive features must be accounted for if we have a model, a powerful model. So these are things we have to keep in mind. Where the stars are numerous, that must be where they spend most of their time. But where there's that long, long period tail, stars with a really long orbital period, there must be a reason for them to do that too. So the question, how do they evolve? Do they just find a place on that diagram or do they move systematically on that histogram? Uh, we're gonna have to come up with an answer to that. But I'm still asking the questions before I do the answers. And I have a third question, how do they die? It was long assumed that they might die in an explosive fashion. On the right side, you can see uh, V838 Mon, a star that blew up in 2002, and people assumed that that was a contact binary star that blew up, but they never saw it before it blew up, so they don't know for sure. Uh, this is a series of Hubble uh, photographs that show the light echoes of the explosion. The real helpful thing was on the left, there was another exploding star in 2008, known as V1309 SCO. And that one also, they had no idea it was going to blow up before it did, but they got lucky because they realized after the fact, I mean, an astronomer named uh, Talenda, that uh, this was in that Ogle survey. And so they were able to look at the brightness of the star for many years before it blew up. And what you can see is the brightness is changing a lot in the uh, left side of that diagram. And it's changing because it was a contact binary star and it was eclipsing itself. So on a random moment, Ogle would see it to be bright if they were side by side or faint if they were one after the other. Notice on the right side, it doesn't have that. The, the line is much smoother. That's because there isn't a contact binary star anymore. It merged. So this is a wonderful example that's gonna give us more hints that we can model. First of all, the orbital period turned out to be 1.4 days. Maybe that's where these guys go to die. They die at the long period end. It also had a pretty small mass ratio, uh, just one-tenth uh, the small star divided by the big star. Maybe that's a typical mass ratio for dying stars, but maybe not. We have to have a model that makes sense of this. So analysis that Talenda did in the data before the star exploded gave us the orbital period as a function of time. You can see it's about 1.4 days, but in this diagram, you can see the period is getting shorter, 1.4 days, 1.43 days, 1.42 days. And it's not only going down, but it's going down at an accelerating rate. This is the signature of something that's spiraling together at an accelerating rate. 
What's sad is that it was another missed opportunity, just like Herschel missed the opportunity to discover contact binaries. The Ogle people could have noticed this rapid variation early 2000s and said, oh, what's going on here? Let's study this in detail. But they weren't paying attention. They only noticed after the thing blew up. So there's no going back to find out the details of what this one looked like before it blew up. But it becomes, to me, a Rosetta Stone that tells us what we can look for. Rapid period change, accelerating uh, period change. If we saw that somewhere, we could predict the next explosion. That's my claim. Now, to be clear, other astronomers think it's unlikely you're going to find that. But these seem common enough that there should be some star out there that is maybe where V1309 SCO was back in 2001, just ready to go. Um, so now I begin my digression. Uh, back in 2013, so just a couple years after Talenda noticed this change in V1309 SCO, I had a student, Dan Van Nord, he's in the, the right on this picture of a classroom, uh, who studied a star, KIC 9832227, great name, uh, that was in the archives of the Kepler satellite that was used for so many planetary discoveries. He noticed that the period changed between the satellite data and some archival data that he found online from earlier. And so he asked me, could this be the next star? Could this be the one that's going to go down? Well, I thought not likely, but we can start to track it and see what happens. Great thing is, even if it's an outlandish idea, it has a specific prediction. So we started observing. So after a year of observing, we saw this diagram. Now this diagram is not quite period versus time. It's what we call an O minus C diagram. It's basically a residual to the period. It's telling us whether the moment of eclipse is coming a little earlier or a little later than you expect. For a binary star that has got a regularly changing period, you expect a parabola, a downward parabola if it's speeding up. In this case, it's not quite a downward parabola, it's an asymmetric downward parabola. So that means it's speeding up, but it's speeding up more and more as it goes along. Well, hey, that's just what we were looking for, so it got us to, to pay attention to it. Now, what kind of science are we doing here? Here we're doing what we call model by analogy. I don't know if this is the contact binary star that's next going to blow up for any physical reason. I just see this uh, change in timing that's analogous to what V1309 SCO did and hope for the best. That's all I could do back in 2014 because I didn't yet understand how contact binaries work. We're gonna talk about that later, but it seemed pretty exciting and got us started on this. So predicting the star to merge, in this case, merge in the very near future, this year, 2022 was the prediction, uh, was a pretty dramatic prediction. And Sherlock Holmes says, when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Well, this is a very outlandish um, prediction. The question then is, could we eliminate all the other possibilities? And one possibility was that it was a triple system like 44 Boo. And what would that mean? If the star is not just orbiting around itself, the pair, but also orbiting around some third star coming towards you and then going away, as it goes around that corner, you might see an acceleration of the period just because it's actually closer to you or further from you. So we had to look carefully to see if there was a third star that was causing the change in the orbital period. So in 2015, we started doing that. And in 2016, we had done spectroscopy and ruled out the third body. We found that the two stars were going around each other. There was a clear signature of each of them, but no signature of a third member. And their velocities were always the same. They weren't uh, the average velocity going up or down. So we could rule that out. We also had more data. You can see all this purple data here, continuing to follow along the, the line that we had before. 
the green data was the Kepler data that gave us the idea. You notice all the data from the couple of years that followed did exactly what we predicted. So basically the improbable was all that we had left and we made a public prediction that this thing was going to merge in 2022. So what happened after we made that prediction? Well, in 2018, we continued to take data. That's the red data points here. And the data from the star looked exactly like what we had predicted. So we were getting very excited about this. A very specific prediction, no degrees of freedom, nothing we could tweak, we just either followed it or not. But then we had assistance from a fellow astronomer in California. Quentin Socia at UCSC wanted to help us out by filling in a gap with more archival data from the early years. He had access to an unpublished data set. And when he uh, found the time for that, it's that uh, box there, uh, not the very upper left one, but the one uh, right below that, uh, uh, below and to the right of that. He found that the timing from that archival data did not match our purple line, which fit all our other data. That was a surprise to him. So he tried to reanalyze all of our other data and he found everything else agreed, except the very first one. In the first one, we had a disagreement, what we saw versus what he saw. We had to interact with him to figure out what was going on. And it turned out it was a false puzzle piece. There was a typo in the paper that we read that gave us that red triangle on the far left uh, that uh, basically told us on what time units uh, were being used for describing the data. And uh, the proper number was the number he got that was an hour later. Bottom line was, instead of having our distorted parabola, things are quite different on the left now. And the basis for our prediction was completely unmade. And so we're no longer thinking this is going to blow up. Well, and here it is, 2022, it hasn't blown up. Um, so a uh, false puzzle piece led us to a wrong conclusion, just as uh, uh, John Goodrick uh, came to a wrong conclusion about the rotation of Algol. But you move on. So now I'd like to get to what uh, we know first about single stars and secondly about contact binary stars. Having been drawn into this by the um, observations um, of KIC 983, uh, it got us thinking a lot about these and asking whether we could really sort, sort this out without that one uh, lucky guess. Um, so quick few slides on regular stars. They form as uh, giant gas clouds, starting from really big diffuse gas clouds like uh, the one you see here from the Orion Nebula. Once they have collapsed down, they're spherical, uh, being uh, determined in shape by the very strong gravity. And uh, they're enormous. Uh, this is comparing to Jupiter and the Earth, stars like our sun. All of these stars are very similar in size to our sun. Temperatures of about 6,000 degrees. They're powered on the inside by hydrogen, uh, fusing ultimately into helium in a multiple, multiple step uh, process. And they can be summarized on this wonderful diagram. It's called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, if you haven't seen it before. We're plotting luminosity on the vertical axis, temperature on the horizontal axis. And here I'm plotting in blue where all the different stars might be found, stars of different mass. And it turns out mass is the only thing you really need to know. The high mass stars are in the upper left, the low mass stars in the lower right. Let's look closer at this uh, diagram. Um, what do we mean by temperature here? <laughs> The coldest stars are still red hot stars. Think of the picture in the lower right there. The hottest stars are really white hot stars. Think of the material you have in a, an automobile factory that is making a high, high quality steel. Uh, so 3000 to 20,000 degrees. Now, the luminosity scale, the vertical scale, notice that's logarithmic scale. So the brightest stars are orders of magnitude brighter than the fainter stars. The way to look at this is the bright stars are like a, a bonfire at a camp 
that might burn extremely bright, but burns out relatively quickly. You might have the bonfire for an hour where the faint stars are so faint that even though they're small stars and don't have much material, they last a long time. So think of that cooking fire that you can still keep burning through the course of the night and still have some embers in the morning to start your morning uh, campfire. Same thing happens with actual stars here. The big ones burn out quickly, the small ones last a long time. Once they have burned out, meaning used up their hydrogen, they then swell up. And this just shows you some sizes of uh, stars you may know, Antares, Betelgeuse, compared to the size of our sun, they swell up enormously once they have uh, what we call left the main sequence, left that blue line because they're out of hydrogen. Today, we don't have to go any further than this, but to say that there is this ballooning in size once you run out of fuel, and we'll see that again later. This diagram now summarizes the motion of stars going from the main sequence where they started, that's my lower line. And with each color, I've got a different size star. The most massive star at the top is a three solar mass star, moves almost straight to the right. The red star there is a half a solar mass star, and it's going almost straight up into the right. There's a whole track of these guys, what they do after they burn out of hydrogen. What happens beyond the dashed line, that's when they reach 15 times the size of our sun, I don't care about because we're not getting that far today. So finally, we get to talk about contact binary stars. What are the elements of our new models? We got an elements for formation. We think there's two steps to it. One step is called Kozai cycles with tidal friction. I'll explain that. The other step is magnetic breaking. In both, in this case, those ideas were both out there for a number of years, but we've only just this summer tried to calculate them specifically to see if their predictions match the observations. Second, the main life. We think that during the main life of a star, there is consistent transfer of mass from the small star to the big star. And um, we've calculated that in detail for the first time, so we can see how long it should last, which stars move faster, where they end up when they're done. And then finally, the death. The death comes, we think, in two steps as well. Uh, tidal instability, we'll talk about, and exponential mass loss through the L2 point. That's the L2 point I mentioned before, where the James Webb telescope is parked. Um, these two ideas for the death have been out there as well, but they've been confused as to which happens first or second. And I think we have some observational evidence to really put these things all into order now. So this is where we're gonna go right now. So binary stars are originally widely separated, but many binary stars have a third companion. If you have a pair going around each other and a third companion say going around perpendicular to that, it can make them become elliptical in their orbit. But tides take elliptical orbits and make them circular. Well, becoming elliptical is taking angular momentum away. Becoming circular is going to a smaller orbit. Back and forth, back and forth, elliptical, circular, elliptical, circular. You can whittle your way down. This is a way and the name for this is Kozai cycles after the guy who first discovered that this back and forth is possible with tidal friction to circularize it. Um, this can happen for stars that happen to have a third star to begin with. But how long can this go? Can this bring them all the way into contact? The answer is no. These stars, when they get closer, begin to feel precession. There's general relativistic precession. You may have heard of this in the case of the planet Mercury. That's what helped Einstein realize general relativity works. It made, is what made Le Verrier, the guy who discovered Neptune, really confused because he was trying to discover the planet Vulcan, thinking that the precession of Mercury was going to help him with that. It never did. The point is, once the thing processes enough, then you don't have this organized angular momentum taking away and the whole thing shuts off. So instead of bringing our star into contact at half a day, it leaves it hanging at about two days. This is what we calculated this summer for the first time. If you start with all possible 
third body systems, big ones, little ones, tilted ones, not tilted ones, a random sampling, tens of thousands of them, it turns out that 3% of them will end up with periods less than two days. This is a wonderful number because not all stars are triple stars to begin with. So that if you consider out of all stars, maybe a third of them are, that takes your 3% down to 1%. And that's how many stars are seen to be contacts. The diagram on the right tells us the likelihood of reaching a different orbital period at the end of this COSI cycle. The right side of this diagram is two days and it gets less and less likely as you go on. Now, why do I start with two days? Well, the question is, how do we go from being a two-day orbit all the rest of the way? If the third body can get us at least that close, magnetic fields might be able to finish the job. How does that happen? We well, can see the magnetic fields of the sun in this beautiful picture of the recent uh, total eclipse in North America. The corona of the sun follows the magnetic fields and sort of outlines it. Think of those field lines as being something that electrons are stuck on and they have to go out along those field lines. So as plasma, hot material leaving the sun uh, moves out, it has to stay on those field lines. And as the sun rotates, the field lines rotate and the electrons on them rotate as well and the protons. Is... And what happens if you're the last guy out going further and further out, you get more and more angular momentum because you're rotating at the same rate, but you're now at a larger radius. It's the velocity times the radius that gives you your angular momentum. So just like the snap the wick uh, picture that you, you see here, the, the kid on the outside can't hold on after a while and they break loose. Eventually the, star, the particles do break loose and they take with them a tiny amount of mass, but a lot of angular momentum. So now the question is just which stars have strong magnetic fields. This diagram shows us for main sequence stars, hydrogen stars, where the convection is. You know that are parts of the sun where the light just comes through by radiation, uh, forms uh, at the center of the sun uh, where the fusion happens and radiation just percolates all the way up. But eventually there's a, a region in our sun, the outer region where it's convection and you can see these convective bubbles. If you've seen uh, the new, uh, in a way, uh, uh, solar telescope in Hawaii that went into place a year or so ago, you get these wonderful uh, uh, movies showing convective cells uh, bubbling up and down on the sun. The gray is telling us where the convection cells are. Uh, the vertical axis is basically from the core of the star to the edge of the star. The horizontal axis is telling us how massive the star and there's this slice in the middle that has radiation white at the bottom and convection gray at the top. It turns out the magnetic fields are strong only if the base of the convection cell, the convection zone is in the right spot. Well, the really massive stars don't even have a convection zone at the top, so they're out. The really low mass stars don't have a base to the convection zone because they are convective all the way in. So it's only these guys in the middle that have really strong magnetic fields. Only the guys in the middle can have magnetic breaking. Only the guys in the middle can become contact binary stars. Those are guys like our sun in mass, a little bit more, a little bit less. So this diagram is showing us why they're the ones and no others that become contact binaries. And um, I've been calculating with my students this summer exactly how well the magnetic fields can uh, do this job. And literally just today finished a calculation that shows strength of the magnetic breaking as a function of mass. It's the guys in the middle that do the job. So now we know how to form it. Two steps, one to bring them kind of close, magnetic breaking to bring them all the rest of the way if you're in the right mass range. But now how do they evolve with time? Well. How are they operating just at the moment? We need to recognize that the primary star, the big guy, is the one that looks like a normal main sequence star. And it's because it is a normal main sequence star. Its nuclear furnace is powering the whole thing. Through the point of contact, it's sharing its light and its heat with its companion. 
Normally we expect the small star to be colder if it's a main sequence star. But in this case, remember both stars at the same temperature, it's because the small star is really just a cooling fin for the big star. So the small star does not have a normal main sequence shape at all. It's completely determined by what the big star is doing to it. I'm having a technical difficulty here, just a moment. So the second part now of our model is to say, not only is the big star powering it, but that we're gonna conserve mass, and we're gonna conserve angular momentum. These are reasonable things to say. As the material goes from the little guy to the big guy, to conserve angular momentum, what's gonna happen? Well, uh, bigger orbits turn out to be, uh, turn out to be, um, sorry here, I'm getting a, extra stuff on my screen. <laughs> um, go away. <laughs> anyway, bigger orbits go slower. That's Kepler's laws. But bigger orbits have more angular momentum because angular momentum is the size of the orbit times the velocity. The velocity is smaller, but the size is much bigger, so the size wins. So how do we conserve angular momentum when we're trading material between the two stars I think of it like buying, uh, borrowing money to buy a car. You earn a salary, so you can use part of that salary to pay interest on the car, part of it to pay the principal, the principal accumulates. Um, now, angular momentum instead of money, what we can say is, oh dear, it's, um, Are there videos coming on blocking your view? Because we just see the slides. Yes, no, it's the, the Q&A and the chat for some reason are up and I'm having trouble getting them to go away. Oh, okay. Uh, so blocking the slides for me. <laughs> can you not uh, close them? Uh, isn't there any uh, For red some box? reason, I've not seen my uh, cursor. If I could see okay. my cursor, I could uh, close them. Let's see, here we go. Um, yeah. Do you still see the slide? Um, not in presentation mode. Oh, okay. Okay, there we go. Back in presentation mode. Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. So we're transferring mass from the small guy, and it's the small guy that has the angle of momentum because it's the one going around to the big guy. Now we got to use uh, that angle of momentum in part to keep the big guy spinning and in part to make the orbit of the little guy bigger. Uh, so the period increase is accumulating just like the principle is accumulating. We are conserving mass and we're okay. So here in red is the big thing. The primary star is driving the mass transfer. If you've, some of you might be familiar with cataclysmic variable stars where you have a small star and then a neutron star. In that case, it's the small star that's doing the transferring and calling the shots for the transfer depending on how the small star changes in size, determines how much transfer there is and can make you a nice X-ray binary if you land material onto a neutron star. But in this case, it's not the small star that's calling the shots, it's the big star. The small star is still contributing the material, but it's the big star that if when the material goes to it, the Roche lobe gets big enough that the big star still fits in the Roche lobe, we're okay. Because of course, as we dump material onto the big star, it's going to grow. But if it grows slower than the Roche lobe grows, then we're stable. And it's that idea that it's the other star that calls the shots that has not been pursued before. And when this works, we have stable mass transfer. The little guy, again, has to do whatever the big guy tells it. And uh, I'll just leave it at that for now. So here are some sample calculations we've done where we started with a big guy of one times the mass of the sun, something like the sun, and small guys with different uh, sizes from a 10th the mass of the sun all the way up to nine tenths. Age on the x-axis there, billions or uh, tens of billions of years there. So 0.2 to one is up to 10 billion years, basically the age of the sun uh, when it dies. 
mass ratios we have vertically, and you can see we're starting at all the different values. The small mass ratio guys last a long time, do hardly anything. The bigger mass ratio guys move material from one to the other. Think of those in-between lines that have a nice angle. The biggest mass ratio guys, they're the ones that have a trouble. When material goes from a equal, almost equal system from one to the other, it's not stable. The other guy grows too quick. And so on a very short amount of time, a large amount of material dumps from one to the other until it gets to the case where it is stable, which is around 0.6 or 0.7 there. So we have a prediction here. You can have contact binary stars. They can be stable for billions of years, but not if their mass ratio is larger than 0.7. In that case, they're not going to last long. If they don't last long, you won't see them. So that's a thing to look for. This was a complete surprise to us. We saw it, and then afterwards we calculated analytically why that's working. Here's the same models, but now looking at the mass ratio versus orbital period. As the mass is being transferred to conserve angular momentum, the orbital periods are getting longer. And you can see particularly the high mass ratio guys end up with the very long periods. The small mass ratio guys didn't change as much. So they're all going down and to the right. So this is gonna be a prediction of what is the mass ratio as a function of period that you can go out and check. So now we come to angular momentum conservation uh, 2.0. <laughs> what happens when you get near the end and you have just this little tiny guy? Well, it, we can talk about the car again, but what happens if you buy the car and you have a decreasing salary and all you can do is pay the interest that means you have to borrow more money to pay more interest. You never build up principal. You have spiraling debt. You're in trouble. Well, what's the analogy for the star? Once the star is really small, we can use up all of the angular momentum just to spin up the massive star and have nothing left to make the little guy move out. Now, why is spinning up the massive star suddenly a problem? It wasn't a problem before. Remember, when you're on the main sequence, the star's not changing much. But when you leave the main sequence, just after you used up your hydrogen, the star rapidly expands. And just like the ice skater, as it expands, it slows. And it's depending on that companion star to speed it up again. But to do that, the companion star has to spiral in. And it's in trouble. This trouble is known as the uh, tidal instability, also the Darwin instability, named after the son of uh, Charles Darwin, an uh, astronomer named George Darwin, who considered that uh, some of the moons in our solar system have the same fate here. So that tells us where to stop the calculation. Here's an HR diagram with my same simulations, the ones we just saw in the last two pictures. The gray lines shows where the main sequence stars are. That's where they spend most of their time. But right at the end, briefly, they move off to the right. Moving to the right is also moving to larger size. And they all stop at about the same temperature there, just under 5,000 degrees. So where do contact binary stars go to die? I now know they go to uh, just under 5,000 degrees and a size that's large and that orbital period that's large. And that's the explanation for the long period tail. They don't spend much time there, but that's where the guys are going to die. And of course, that's exactly where V1309 SCO was found when it died. And that's exactly where the Kickstar 983 was not. It had a short period, so it never had a chance. Here is another way of looking at our models, period versus temperature. And uh, in the upper left, you can see it's an animation going with time, they're all a little bit down into the left at the beginning and over time they evolve away. As we look at different parts of the sky, we might look at older stars, younger stars, and actually make predictions about how different groups of stars will have different groups of contact binaries. These are in gray, the um, observations from the Kepler catalog and the average position there matches very well the average position that we observe. So there's a whole way a whole host of ways that we are testing this. So uh, things to look for, high mass ratios, you avoid 
uh, unstable regime, uh, the very low mass ratios we avoid. And, oh, what happened there? Ah, there's supposed to be a picture here on the right <laughs> that shows observations from Kepler that we just published last month. And it actually followed this. And I don't know what happened to the slide, I'm sorry. But we don't see high mass ratio guys and we don't see anything uh, down and below the white space at the bottom of the, the diagram. Uh, so it was really a wonderful confirmation, which uh, you'll have to look it up online. It's the Astrophysical Journal. <laughs> um, so let me just assure you that it, it, uh, we have begun to test this and it is working. Um, so now we've got just a minute or so left. What about the last step? The tidal instability I've described for you. At that time, the orbital period is changing rapidly and it's going back to smaller values. So it's a negative change in the period where all of the time before that for billions of years, it was a high, a positive change in the period. We looked at these same Ogle stars that uh, I mentioned earlier. And this diagram shows the 100 Ogle stars that had the largest orbital period change. On the left, we see where the typical stars are and what the typical change is. Those are stars that actually do have third body companions. Equal likelihood of positive or negative change as the stars go around each other, equal likelihood of large or small values. But on the right side, where that long period tail is, where there aren't many stars, it turns out that's where all of the stars with really large period changes currently are, and they're all negative, none zero, none positive. These guys are currently experiencing, we claim, the tidal instability, which means they're on the next to last stage of death. So what's the last stage of death? As these things are coming together, they come together so fast that the stars can't change in any other way. Their volume is fixed, but their orbit is smaller. So they're filling up their Roche lobe more and more. If they were just barely touching at first, that is to say touching at the L1 point, eventually they're gonna to be touching at the L2 point. Remember that L2 point there. Once you overflow the L2 point, then you lose material out the back end. And if you lose a little material out the back end, you come closer and you're digging deeper into the atmosphere of the star, you're gonna lose material faster. So we expect an exponential runaway once you start digging into the atmosphere of the star. And that then is not just a period change, but it's a period change that grows exponentially. That's what we saw V1309 SCO to be doing. And so think of the material running away from that tennis ball as it spins around. That's what's happening as you're leaving it out the L2 point. And um, the lower right is a, um, a visualization of this done by uh, an astronomer in the Czech Republic. You can see spirals coming out from the binary star, which is the red thing in the middle, as it goes out through the L2 point. Uh, this is work that's been done, well, especially by this guy in, in the Czech Republic, um, and uh, not by me, but I think it's a good thing. That is the last stage before, boom. You get close enough, friction is gonna lead to a final merger and you get the final explosion. So what's left? We'd like to fit our model to actual orbital period histograms. We've already seen in two different populations in our galaxy, different histograms, and we should be able to match those now that we have a complete model. We have to have both the formation and the evolution before we can make predictions. And that's only just possible literally now. Um, we may even find that this is the most powerful way to understand magnetic breaking. Magnetic breaking is a really tough subject and there may be flaws because it's not been tested in the magnetic breaking models. If it turns out certain magnetic breaking matches our histograms better, this may be the best way to study magnetic field production in stars. And we might be able to use this back for those cataclysmic variables who are also experiencing the magnetic field breaking. And lastly, big all sky surveys are now being done. Billions of stars are being surveyed. If we can find the contact binaries there, we now know where to look. We look at the longer period ones. We look at the ones with extreme mass ratios. If we find one with a exponentially changing uh, period, 
then we have identified the next one to explode. Um, there's no guarantee we'll be able to do that, but I think that's a realistic possibility. And that's what I hope to be doing in the next few years. So thank you for your attention. Uh, open to any questions. Thank you very much, Larry. That was great. Uh, very interesting, the uh, progress that's going and all the prospect. <clears throat> so now let me uh, remind everybody that the floor is open for questions. Uh, please go ahead and find the Q&A button on your uh, Zoom client and uh, you could uh, type in uh, any questions you have. Uh, so if I may, I would like to start uh, with a question that concerns those who would like maybe to carry on similar research. Uh, were you using any privileged data or the publicly available Kepler data uh, for doing uh, some of your research? Um, we've been using public data for all of the research I talked about today. Uh, for the Kep the one particular binary, we took a lot of data that uh, we'd be glad to share, but uh, it's just one binary. It's not particularly important in that sense. Uh, the large data sets that are now available are just uh, incredible for their opportunities. Um, and uh, were you expecting uh, when the Vera Rubin Observatory comes online, that would make a huge difference? Yes, yes. I mean, it just increases the volume of the galaxy that will be accessible to us. Um, and the great thing for the merger question is that the period change is so great that even after a year or two, you should be able to notice it. Oftentimes with period change, you might think you need five or 10 years to notice. That is gonna be a guy that's visible within the first couple of years. Okay, perfect. Uh, now, uh, since, since we're at the very end, uh, could you please uh, explain again exactly what causes the star to explode at the end? Uh, rather than, it's just an implosion at the beginning, right? Yes, yes. Um, so that, uh, that part, boom, that part has been actually studied by a number of people uh, in detail. So that's the one step I have not actually personally contributed to, but I think really fine work has been done. Uh, there's a, a Professor Ivanova in Canada that's done some work and others. Um, the key is as these stars are coming closer to each other, they're losing material through the L2, that's causing them to come closer still. They have trouble keeping synchronized. All the time up to now, we've been able to be synchronously rotating and synchronously orbiting. So as the two stars go around each other, there's no friction. And that's an important thing. Uh, you may have heard, if you've read a lot of astronomy about the idea of a common envelope catastrophe. This is a case of a common envelope that's not a catastrophe, and you really have to separate that out. Because we're synchronously rotating, there's no friction, we can live for billions of years with no problems whatsoever. But at the very end of this L2 spiral in, it does not have time to synchronize because it takes time for friction to get things synchronized. So now you have a star that is spinning around through another star at a different rate at which the star is spinning, there's a lot of friction there and it has become the common envelope catastrophe that uh, occurs in other cases as well. That friction means that we're going to lose our orbital uh, energy and spiral in very rapidly. Having a small star landing at the core of a big star is the release of an enormous amount of energy and it can be done in a somewhat dynamic time scale. So days uh, or hours even, that much energy all released at the same time is going to be deposited in the envelope of the star, which is gonna blow that envelope away. And that is what we see as a red nova explosion. Um, at some point, as this thing goes out, it, it becomes transparent. It's that radius of transparency that we see as the size of the explosion. As the material continues to flow out into it, that size actually maintains its, it, it, it's fixed for a remarkable amount of time, uh, days, weeks, even months, even though the material itself is rapidly moving through, 
The material on the inside is still energetic. The material on the outside is cool and invisible. And it's the material at the surface that we see as the surface of this red nova outburst. Uh, and that turns out to be a thing that can be calculated by clever people, and it has been, and it uh, matches pretty well explosions like V1309. Now, uh, after the explosion, uh, what does remain? Does the core of the smaller star merge with the larger star, or is that uh, blown away? The small star now is just this tiny core. It's now in the, the larger star, and what remains is a rapidly rotating star. If you had one of these, say, in a cluster of stars, and you know the age of that cluster, you would be surprised when you saw it because older clusters tend to have slowly rotating stars, especially the solar-like stars, because they all have magnetic braking that has slowed them down over the age of this cluster. And here's this isolated single star that is rotating very rapidly. And it's rapid rotation is just telling us that it has a, a cannibalistic history that uh, you would otherwise not have any idea about. If you waited a billion years, uh, let's say you look at a cluster that's a billion years older, um, eventually that would slow down again by magnetic breaking, and uh, you might even then uh, see it to be a slowly rotating star. Um, so uh, there are sorted past histories of stars that might be your friends, <laughs> that uh, single stars today, but not always in the past. Thank you. And uh, a questioner says that they have read the predictions for the supernova explosion in the constellation Cygnus has been postponed. And they're wondering if, if you know, uh, will it occur next year or any idea when it may happen? Right. So, okay, two points. One is it's not a supernova explosion, but a red nova. Supernova is a single star, a massive star blowing up. Red nova is the merger of a contact binary. But second, sadly, <laughs> that is the prediction that we made that we have now uh, taken back uh, with the publication of Socha's paper. Um, it is now basically warranted for another couple billion years uh, <laughs> as that particular star slowly moves out to its longer orbital period and eventually will blow up. But it now becomes, for that individual, a case of the long-term prediction that um, is less exciting, right? Uh, predictions that can be tested, I said, are the exciting ones for models. You, you do hear people say, well, Betelgeuse will blow up within the next million years or so, and I'm sure it will, but <laughs> that's not a very specific prediction, so there's not much we can do with it. <laughs> Uh, the Kickstar will blow up in the next billion years or so, but uh, it's no longer an interesting prediction. Um, but what's nice is we now understand why it wasn't a good prediction in the first place. It's got the wrong orbital period. We also see it has the wrong mass ratio. It's got a mass ratio of about a third and needs to be three times smaller than that. So we know when we do find the next guy who is a good candidate, that we will have a reliable uh, prediction at that time. Perfect, thank you. And uh, will uh, James Webb Space Telescope be able to contact, uh, image contact binary stars directly? No, uh, James Webb is a wonderful telescope for many purposes. In fact, it might be wonderful for contact binaries just because uh, many of those in our galaxy are enshrouded in the dust of our galactic plane. They will have a clearer view, but um, uh, they don't have any better angular resolution. They don't have nearly the angular resolution needed to see these guys. I mean, think of it again, it's about the size of our sun and you're not resolving stars the size of our sun at distances of 40 light years and up. Okay, thank you. And now another area of astronomy that is a hot topic, that's exoplanets. So uh, if the questioner wants to know if there is pos if it has been calculated or if it's possible for binary stars and perhaps contact binaries to have any uh, planets orbiting around them. Good question. And the answer is yes. Um, exoplanets is a field where huge progress has been made in recent decades. 
And many of the assumptions, uh, well-founded in physics that I was taught in undergraduate uh, in the 1970s have all been cast aside as uh, uh, too narrow, right? People were surprised and they didn't have a broad enough view to say what is possible. Uh, early on, people would have said, um, planets around uh, binary stars are unlikely because of the three body dynamics that come into it. But it turns out there are many particular orbits that work just fine. In the case of a contact binary, what we would expect is the planet to orbit the pair um, as opposed to orbiting one of them because there just isn't room there to orbit the one. Uh, there is the possibility in wider binaries to have planets orbiting one and have the other guy out there. But in this case, it would be what are known uh, by astronomers as Tatooine stars. <laughs> uh, Luke Skywalker had a binary star in his uh, evening sky and his planet of Tatooine was orbiting that pair. That was a hypothetical on George Lucas's part, but uh, turns out to be completely physically plausible. Perfect, thank you. And uh, somebody wants to know about the origins of these uh, binary stars. So we know uh, one way is that if they are formed at the same time from the same uh, nebula, uh, but is it possible for the binaries uh, to be captured, uh, like meaning the star capturing another star? Yes. Um, two good points. <laughs> Let me take them one at a time. Um, Binaries naturally form from the same cloud uh, at the same time. In fact, it seems that often a cloud that wants to form a star finds it has too much angular momentum and that it's easier to split in two and continue having the two uh, collapse down than to where it's just simply not possible for the one to collapse down. It is spinning too fast for that. So sort of a fission happens very early on so it's very natural and easy to form a binary star. Uh, so we don't need to capture a binary companion, which is okay because it's kind of hard to capture a binary companion. To capture a binary companion, you have to have a really close encounter and that doesn't happen. But the idea of capture is important when it comes to the third star. And having a third star is not that uncommon. And it's critical to everything I said today because all of our contact binaries have to have originally had a third star. So how do you get a third star going? Well, if you've got one binary and then somewhere in the neighborhood, you'll have another binary. If you have the two binaries come close to each other, you can have one binary steal a member of the other binary and loose the fourth star and it goes out. So you have a poorly detached wide third guy, a detached fourth guy, and then the inner binary. This is not unlikely because you have a bigger cross section. You don't have to hit the star. You just have to come close to the pair. And the pair is much bigger, widely spaced than the individual star. And so the cross section for that kind of a hit is really good. You got binaries everywhere in a young star cluster. Some of those binaries are gonna collide close enough with others of the binaries. And that's how we get triples. Very interesting. Uh, thank you very much, Larry. Um, I have covered all the questions. Uh, before we go and end this meeting, uh, do you have any final comments or remarks? Um, I guess my last comment is just to say that I specifically started on this topic of contact binaries because I had that 16 inch telescope and I wanted to find something my students could do. And these are very friendly objects for small telescopes. You can choose one of these, study it in detail, make a model of it. That's something that the, um, the big surveys aren't able to do, especially there's interesting things with magnetic fields that you can see and they change on short time scales. So intense observing of contact binaries has a lot to teach us yet. And uh, that's a place where uh, individual small telescope owners can make a contribution. It got me going on this and uh, you might consider it yourself. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much, Larry, for the time you uh, gave us. Uh, totally enjoyed it. 
And uh, let me let everybody know, actually, uh, at OCA, we have a program called Cosmic Adventures, if you're not already familiar with that, that we aim to carry similar research. Uh, so look for it on the website. And uh, there's a lot of kudos coming your way, Larry. I don't know if you see them on the screen. Yeah. Uh, very much appreciated. Uh, at the end, I would like to thank uh, all the panelists and all the other presenters for being here and also uh, thank all the attendees for to be with us tonight. So please check the calendar on our website for all our upcoming events at ocastronomers.org. And with this, I wish you all a great time ahead. Uh, thanks, everybody. And